Hello again, everybody. Welcome to Michael's Record Collection, where we talk about great music with the people who make it and the people who love it. I'm joined today by Mark Bowles. Mark, thank you for your time today. Hey, thanks for having me. And you're on a ship. That was It was fun listening to your captain for a while. Yeah, he's given the weather report. I mean, the winds and everything. I mean, just ridiculous. They, they have nothing better to do. Uh, the ship basically runs itself, I think. I mean, it is the biggest ship in the world. Uh, there's almost 9,000 people on here, including wow. the crew. Wow. that's uh, yeah. What ship is it? Uh, Oasis of the Seas. It's a rough Caribbean ship. All right. Well, enjoy your cruise. I'm, I'm talking to you today. Uh, we're here to talk about the new Ring of Fire album, Gravity, which was released November 11th on Frontiers Music. But before we start in on our conversation about that, I wanted to ask you what your first favorite record was. That's a tough one because, you know, everybody always asks me that. But I, I like when I was a kid, they used to send out these things in the mail uh, from Columbia Record Club. Mm -hmm. And you get 12 records for 99 cents. So my first record was actually 12 records. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, they were really bad uh, printings, pressings, whatever you want to call it, which I know now, but I didn't know then. You could pick up the record. And, I mean, it would be floppy. It wasn't even. <laughs> Not so, a 180 uh, gram vinyl there. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. But anyway, I got a good. Ex I, so, I mean, I can't remember all 12 of them, but I, I know one was Jethro Tall Aqualong. And it was Black Sabbath Paranoid. It was Deep Purple. And uh, I don't remember which one, but it was probably... Uh, Probably be the first one that they released here in America. Uh, what else? Uh, it was Three Dog Night. I was really into Three Dog Night. I, I've got quite a, quite a bit of different ones, but um, you know, my favorite rock bands. I can't remember which one was first, which one I love first, but I, I love Deep Purple and Black Sabbath, and uh, I, I I liked everything uh, across the board that that had good singing. I was really into singers, so. I, I really liked even Tom Jones and James Brown and uh, people who weren't rockers, but were intense singers anyway. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Did you, did you, um, when you were a kid, did you do the thing with the hairbrush where you, you know, pretended to be the singer and, and sang the, into the mirror or something? Well, no, because my dad had a little, he had a, a reel to reel tape recorder with the microphone so i started recording myself with the microphone so i didn't need a hairbrush <laughs> that's great so you were one up on a lot of your friends so you uh you were singing from the get-go but it sounds like you you took to um heavy rock pretty quickly what was it about it that kind of spoke to you um i don't know it was it was uh it was a an in, uh, an influence of a rebellious influence i guess and it was new and, and exciting. I mean, it was just a new sound. I mean, up until that point, I'd been listening to AM radio and AM radio hits and the Beatles and the Monkees and everything else. And of course, I realize now the Beatles influenced a lot of those heavy bands, mm -hmm. but um, I didn't get it then. I thought that these guys were geniuses and came up with this out of nowhere. And and uh, it was just, uh, I mean, I used to lay on the floor and put the speakers, I didn't have headphones, so I put the speakers <laughs> put my head in between the speakers <laughs> uh it probably damaged my hearing a little bit but uh i i really loved that music and then fm radio started playing that kind of stuff and then i really you know all that kind of music really took off and fm radio was the thing and am was out yeah um so how does a kid from youngstown ohio end up joining savoy brown well I, I don't know how to put this in a short story, but I'll try. Uh, at the Northeastern Ohio area where I came from was full of music people, full of great, great musicians. The list is just a mile and miles long. Sure. And I don't know if it was the water there or what, but I grew up with just great influences everywhere. And I, when I went, I would go to like, we had an amusement park called uh, Idora Park and they, the radio station used to put on a festival twice a year. And so the first real bands I saw, I was like 10 years old. I went there and there was national acts there and local bands there. And the local bands were every bit as good as the national acts. I mean, the national acts were bands like uh, uh, the Eagles, Raspberry. Raspberries were actually from Cleveland. Um, can't think. Oh, well, there was uh, 
looking glass the, the band that did brandy yeah <laughs> and there was, there was a lot but there was a lot of local bands and they sounded every bit as good or better than than the national acts that's the kind of level of music that i that i grew up in and the bands i started playing with i i quickly found great musicians to work with and with Savoy Brown, uh, Kim Simmons, of course, was founder of Savoy Brown and is a great legendary guitar player. And uh, he, uh, at some point, moved to Ohio. And I was in uh, recording in some studios in, uh, I was playing in local bands around Cleveland. And uh, so I recorded and started recording demos in studios in Cleveland. And he was in Cleveland recording some new stuff. Uh, and I, the engineer said, hey, uh, he's, he needs a bass player that can sing. You know, do you think you can do it? And I said, yeah, yeah. Well, who was his last bass player? He was, his last bass player was Tim Bogart. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so I, had to, I, did little, I had to brush up and shed a little bit, but because uh, uh, the song I auditioned for him was uh, uh, Superstitious, the, the version, the Beck Bogart and Appas version, okay. which uh, Tim sang and played. And it was, it was pretty complicated to play that and sing it too. So... And uh, yeah, he hired me and I went out and started playing uh, blues clubs around, you know, Chicago, New York, Texas, all the big blues places. Yeah, it's such a small world. Uh, Carmine Apiece was one of my most recent interviews. So, um, oh, I know Carmine, yeah. Yeah, we're just talking about uh, NBA. So, um, but you, um, from Savoy Brown, you ended up playing bass for Ted Nugent in the mid 80s. And uh, how did that happen? How did you go from one to the other? Well, Ted, uh, we were playing at the Texas Jam, and Ted Nugent came to the show. Like when I played with uh, Subway Brown, there was always famous guitar players coming out to see him because they were all influenced by him. So Ted was one of them. I mean, other guys have come, like Billy Gibbons, and just uh, and uh, like Leslie West, and all the old guys would come and come out to see him. So Ted saw me playing with them, and he said, "Hey, I need I need somebody." And well, actually, his his. Uh, one of his management people was drunk on his ass and came to me after the show and said, hey, Ted Nugent wants you to play in his band. And I'm like, yeah, right, sure, right. And he's like, no, I'm serious. He wants, to wants you to play in his band. I'm like, get away from me. And he dragged me to a phone and he called the hotel and put Ted on the phone. And, Ted, and I recognized his voice. I said, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> I'm so, so drunk, but I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> and so that and from there i flew to new york and uh started working on stuff with ted and uh and then i you know i spent time up at his ranch and yeah i went hunting with him and feeding the deer and all the deer blinds that he has up in his private acreage up in northern michigan and his hunting cabin up there on a private lake and it's all about hunting with him <laughs> <laughs> yeah still it sounds like it still is um what brought you to California in the mid eighties? What, what prompted you to move out there? Was it just uh, looking for a different music scene or? Um, well, I was mostly a divorce. I tried to get as far away as I could without falling in the ocean. And that from Ohio, that was, that was as far as you could go. And, and LA was supposed to be the music place, you know, where you need to be. And, and it was like the scene in the eighties. So, um, yeah, I went out there with sixty dollars in my pocket, suitcase, and two bass guitars, okay. and I didn't know anyone. It worked out for you because you ended up with uh, you know, performing with Ingve Malmsteen. Uh, take me through that meeting Ingve, getting the gig, and, and performing on Trilogy. Well, um, I actually did a tour with him first, mm -hmm. um, the marching out tour. But um, I was in, I was doing, uh, you know, when I got there. A couple of girls put me up for a while, and then I started auditioning for bands, and I found a few local bands, started playing around, and then I started doing recording some demos, and, and I recorded a demo with a really great guitar player named Kerry Sharaf, who, who did the first Billy Squire album, and uh, Ingbe's manager heard that uh, demo, and also I had auditioned just previously for a band with Ainsley Dunbar, Tim Bogart, and uh, uh, Ronnie Montrose, however Ronnie Montrose disappeared so that didn't happen but Ainsley put in a good word for me too with the uh, with Ingbe's management so it was between the demo and Ainsley probably more Ainsley than anything because he, he's a really cool guy and uh so I went in and audi auditioned and I I played probably every Deep Purple sang every Deep Purple song there is with Ingbe and he didn't want to play his own songs and uh we had two weeks to prepare for the tour and we, the first show was uh 
uh, Oakland Stadium, 80,000 people live on MTV. And we're basically, I didn't know his songs at all. I knew the Deep Purple songs. <laughs> we didn't play those. We played his. Yeah, it was quite an experience. And um, from there, we went on tour with ACDC for an entire USA tour. And uh, then we came back and did the Trilogy album and went back on tour with ACDC again in 86. So 85 and 86, we were out with ACDC the whole year, both years. Wow. Uh, that must have been uh, something to be, you know, to see them every night, actually, at, at the height of their power like that. Oh, yeah, they're a machine, and they were fantastic people, really nice people. They were so nice to their – they're a huge success because of how they treat their crew and how they treat everybody, even their opening act. They treat everybody really well and like family, you know. I don't, I, I'm sure they still do the same thing, but I, I used to hang out with Brian the singer a lot, drank a lot of Jack Daniels with him. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Uh, now, you started Ring of Fire in uh, right around the turn of the century. Um how did that come together? How 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 did you end up with with uh, Tony and and with Vitaly and and how did that sort of emerge? You know, now that I think of it, I, I know how I met uh, Tony because well, I had some some Japanese uh, friends, and they said you you should make a solo album. I said oh, okay, all right, and you should get Tony McAlpine. I was who's Tony McAlpine? And then I didn't really know who he, I kind of knew who he was. But I, I had a little meeting with him, and he was a really cool guy. And we drank some beers and decided to start a band. And um, he recommended uh, Virgil Donati for drums, uh, who had just come from Australia, fresh from fresh off the boat. And uh, Vitaly, how did I meet Vitaly? I don't know, maybe it was through Mike Varney, because uh, he did some stuff with Mike Varney with his band Our Tension before that. So, um, yeah, it was probably Mike Varney. Uh, he's the culprit. And anyway, and no, but, but I love Vitaly. He's he's a character, uh, and you know, uh, and Philip was a he was a bass player with uh, Steve Vai, and he's he uh, he actually went to uh, Berkeley with he was roommates with Steve Vai when they were both at music school in Berkeley, and I know Steve Vai really well. He's a friend, so uh, that's that's how they all came together. That's the original cool. band. So you you have this band Ring of Fire, but you've you've always kept busy. In two thousand two and two thousand three, you did um, some work with Lana Lane and her husband Eric Norlander on separate solo albums, Project right. Shangri La and Music Machine. H how did you cross paths with them? It doesn't seem like the same scene. No, it's not. Uh, let me think. Man, that's so long ago. Um, well, Eric, I guess the yeah the Japanese label. Uh, he worked with a, a label over there called Marquis Avalon, and the, that's who I ended up putting my solo albums and the first Ring of Fire albums on first before okay. I signed the Frontiers. But they, they only handled Japan, but they recommended Frontiers. And so uh, that's the connection between Frontiers. And, and uh, he was uh, actually mixing and doing a bunch of stuff for Marquis Avalon, and he mixed the first, a couple of albums, I think, for, he mixed the... Uh, Mm, which one the oracle i think he mixed the oracle album for ring of fire and that's how i met him so that was about the right timing yeah great um i've had lana on the show actually and, and i had i had Jesus. eric's bandmates from from rocket scientists but eric wasn't available that day so i just had mark and, and uh don but uh oh, but, they've been together forever yeah yeah uh, and it occurred to me, too, that I have actually seen you perform live with a band called Syzygy. Oh, yeah. So yeah. you you did some vocals for this album, Realms of Eternity, in uh, this came out in 2009. Uh, how did you cross paths with Syzygy and do some shows with uh, with this progressive rock band? Uh, well, Carl, the, he's kind of the force behind that band. He's the leader, and he's a guitar player and songwriter. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew him from Ohio days. He's from Cleveland originally. Uh, he had a, uh, another band, a uh, cover band, when I was starting out with cover bands. We were kind of competitors, uh, playing the same clubs and stuff. And uh, he, he contacted me at some point. I don't remember exactly when, but we started talking and talking about the good old days. And then he asked me if I want, would be interested in uh, singing on that stuff. And I said, yeah, sure. So I flew into Cleveland to hang out. He had a nice house on the lake and it was a, a nice experience. He's a really nice guy, and he's a, he's actually a very successful banker. Um, 
so he financed the project and everything so that's that comes in handy i guess uh, yeah. Yeah, uh carl baldassar you, you guys i saw you guys at three rivers prog fest in pittsburgh right and right. uh it was uh what i liked about that was carl they had they had an album out but carl said that he wanted to get he wanted to bring in a ringer to sing some of these songs on the new album to give them a um you know a new life and it's uh you know some of what you've done in the past has been progressive rock some of it's been progressive metal and it just seems like you have an affinity not just for heavy rock but for for progressive music as well oh yeah yeah i've always loved that kind of stuff i i was uh to make a story even longer when i first started playing bass i really loved jazz fusion i started really getting jazz fusion i was into uh return to forever and mahavishnu and and of course, Jocko and Stanley Clark were my favorite guys. And I learned, I slowed down the records, learned all their licks. And uh, and that was easy to go from there to, uh, there was some, you know, it's it's all out there in the fringes, you know, with uh, yeah. lots of twiddly bits. <laughs> <laughs> Before the age of shredding, yeah. I call it twiddly bits. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good, that's an apt description, I think. Um You've also had uh, just about to get into this Gravity album, but you you've had a busy 2022. As I said, you you always stay busy, but in March you had an album out uh, with Shining Black, the second album from Shining Black, Postcards from the End of the World, with guitarist Olaf Thorson. Um, tell me a little bit about how that's doing for you. Well, unfortunately, uh, I don't want to say anything bad about Frontiers, but they didn't promote any of that stuff. I mean, they basically just threw it out there. I didn't have any interviews, uh, nothing really. Um, but as far as uh, me and Olaf, we love working together and we're, we're proud of those albums. I think they're great. And uh, I'd love to work more and do some shows with them too. Um, he's got a great little band and, and he's a great guitar player and a really cool guy. We're really good friends. And, you know, we're both kind of pissed that they didn't promote it. But Yeah, I mean, it's a good album. Did you... You and Olaf met each other and decided to do a project, or how did that come together? Well, he contacted me to to be the singer for Labyrinth when Roberto uh, Taranti left the band, and uh, right. I was going through it. But I was going through some. I had a one of my best friends passed away right in front of me. I had a lot of personal trauma, and I just kind of left the scene for a long time, for over a year, and so. And then Roberto came back, so. But he he remembered me and uh, contacted me. You know what it, was it three years ago uh, to do this project? He said, "Do you want to do a project?" I said, "Yeah, sure." Okay. And um, how, when the, when you guys did Shining Black, was that collaborative writing? Did each of you bring in songs and then work on them together uh, after you brought in an initial song? How did the writing process go with that? Well, yeah, he he he's really fast with coming up with. Uh, riffs and 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 song ideas and he's he basically did all the music himself and okay. i did the, the melodies and some of the lyrics so i'm really good with melodies so okay now how does that differ from ring of fire do you guys work more collaborative collaboratively with ring of fire or do you do you do more of the songwriting with ring of fire well i have and in the past i've written full songs music lyrics and melodies everything um but on this one, uh, Vitaly wrote five of the musical ideas, and I did the, all the lyrics and melodies. And the other five songs were written by Aldo, the, the uh, music part. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they would just send me music tracks, and I'd come up with lyrics and melody to go over top of it. So, I mean, that's the way. I, I have so many different ways of writing. I mean, sometimes I'll, if I'm writing myself, I'll do a melody first. So that's one of that, and then put music to it, and then put lyrics to it. Sometimes I have lyrics and do it the other way around. But most of the time when I'm working with other musicians, uh, they'll send me musical ideas and I put the vocals on top, the lyrics and the melody. Yeah. You guys were pretty prolific um, when you guys started out. You had three three studio albums out pretty quickly and a live album. Uh, what was the decision to disband all about? Was, was it just not happening for you? Did, some, did people get other projects? Yeah, everybody kind of got busy and... Uh, you know, I was stuck in the middle between, you know, all the three virtual, all of them are virtuosos and virtuosos, they're like little kids, you know, you gotta, you gotta corral them. Like 
it's like herding cats. You gotta, because uh, I don't want to say what they say, but uh, Virgil would complain about Tony. Tony would complain about Virgil. Vitaly would complain about Tony. But they would complain. Tony would complain about Vitaly. Everybody complained about everybody, and I had to be in the middle of the peacemaker and nothing serious, but it just it. It's like this all the time. Yeah. Uh, I can see it, how that would be difficult to be stuck in the middle of that. So you guys uh, had a, a break, but you came back in 2014 for Battle of Leningrad. And now mm -hmm. you're putting out your fifth album and um, the first one since 2014, another another long gap. But uh, Tony's not on this one. W was he asked to come back? Did he not have time to come back? How did that happen? I, I did ask him, but his manager now wants him to just do instrumental music. And his solo career wants him to concentrate on his solo career. And so he wasn't able to do it. But we're still good friends. Mm -hmm. Tony, we still hang out. Well, he, I was, yeah, I did ask him. Was I was excited to see uh -huh. that you got Aldo uh, on guitars, Aldo Lenobile from Secret Sphere, because he's... A fantastic guitar player who I think should be better known in this country. And, um, of course, Vitaly's back. And I think that the two of them really have a great chemistry on this record. I just lost my video of you. I don't know where it is. Let me see if I can find it. There it is. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. No at, least, at least I didn't lose you. That's the important part. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I was excited that, that you and Aldo uh, hooked up for this because Aldo is a, a fantastic guitar player for Secret uh -huh. Sphere. And uh, he and he and Vitaly seem to to have a great chemistry on this record. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the good thing, uh, Aldo is really super easy to work with. And uh, he kind of, he can take a lot of abuse. <laughs> not, that, not that anybody gives him any, but uh, Vitaly's kind of picky and and. You know he's he's really uh, established himself as a really cla fine classical pianist, and this classical he's into the classical crowd kind of vibe now, uh, mm -hmm. and they're very very picky, very very picky about everything. Not with me. He, he for some reason I get a, a blank check with him, but uh, <laughs> but he put he kind of put Aldo through the ringer a little bit, but it all came out good, and they're all all great in the end, and he's everybody's happy in the end. So. Yeah, Aldo's band Secret Sphere put out one of my favorite uh, power metal uh, albums last year. Um, but uh, so it's it's Aldo Lenobile on guitars, uh, Vitali, and forgive me if I mispronounce his last name, Kupri on keyboards. Vitali Kupri, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's Ukrainian. Yeah, Stefano Scola on bass and Alfonso uh, Mosarino on drums. Uh, are these all Frontiers Italian guys, or how did you find the bassist and drummer? Yeah, they're they're Aldo's friends. Yeah, they're Aldo's. Aldo recommended them, so uh, yeah, they're Italian. They're part of the Italian factory song uh, music factory. I don't know. <laughs> you know, so, some of the guys just uh, not them guys in particular, but there's certain people that put out like twenty albums a year. Um, it's just kind of. But that's yeah. Frontiers kind of demands that out of those guys. They they put them, they sign them to exclusive. So I'm not signed exclusive, but um, that can be a problem. I mean, that was a problem for Dino. The the singer was supposed to be singing with White Snake, because when White Snake left Frontiers, they forbid him from singing with White Snake, and he's he's signed to. He's trying to get out of the deal. I hope he can get out of it because it's wow. not fair. Yeah, that's not good. No, I'm talking about Dino Jelusic. He's a mm -hmm. really great singer. Yeah. So tell me about Gravity. When did you guys start writing this thing? Um, last year. Um, it got delayed. It, it really got delayed a lot because of TSO. Because we started like putting the songs together be right before fall. It was like right in the summer, end of summer, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, you know, with the TSO, uh, it's like a four-month thing with their, their rehearsals and their preparations in their tour. So... Vitaly wasn't able to, and then he, he needs recovery time, I guess. I don't blame him. They're, they're, they play, like, I don't know how many shows, like eight shows a week or something, nine shows a week. I don't know. Yeah. It's a pretty intense schedule. It's easy for the singers because they only sing two or three songs, but uh, the band's got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those guys, uh, they don't mess around. They get out there and they play and they play and they play. So They put uh, on a great show. It's really a great production now. I mean, it's huge. Um, and they're all great, too. So yeah. I, a lot of them are my friends. So, 
So this is, uh, this is anyway, a, yeah, we, we really started getting it together, getting the songs finished up, like in the beginning of this summer this year. So, mm -hmm. so it's a this is I think maybe one of the first post lockdown albums that I've talked to somebody about actually. Yeah, yeah, we were yeah, well, yeah, it wasn't locked down anymore, but it was still COVID. I've still had COVID a couple more times since then. <laughs> But I never, it wasn't, it didn't affect me bad. I mean, I've had some friends that died from it, unfortunately. Mm. Um, but I, I never got really sick from it, but it was just like a mild flu for me. And um, because of traveling a lot, really, it's, I mean, I wear a mask and everything, but uh, it's, it's, I don't know, it's only partially effective, so. Yeah, you, you the more exposure you get to others, the, in the I mean, you're on a boat with 9,000 people right now, so. Chances yeah, are some folks are going to get it on the boat. And the plane flights aren't exactly ideal for uh, keeping yourself free of germs either. So yeah, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of, doing a lot of plane flights. So yeah. So was this one of those deals where you all did your parts in your home studios and and sent it all in? Well, I think uh, Aldo has a studio, and I. I I'm pretty sure he recorded the the drums and the bass guys and his guitars in his studio. Mm -hmm. uh, Vitaly though doesn't have a studio, so he went to a, a studio uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, I can't remember the name of the studio, um, but it's where he's he's done all of his uh, Artension records and stuff. It's somebody he's worked with for years. But I I have my own studio for vocals. It's uh, <clears throat> I used to have a full blown studio and record. I recorded some Ring of Fire albums there with the, uh, I mean, I got really good at recording drums and guitars and stuff. And then I proved that I could do it. And then I wasn't really interested in doing it because I really wanted to just sing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, and besides that, the fact that everybody records in their bedroom now, I didn't have much business. Uh, so uh, I've just, I got a home studio now. I set up, a, I have a nice room and I have a vocal booth and uh, all the gear I would ever need. Mm-hmm. I know how to record myself, which I've been in big studios where the engineers think they know what they're doing and don't and try to try to be producers. And that's why I started recording myself in the first place. Because, yeah. uh, I, you know, after singing for as many years as I've been singing, I don't need somebody to tell me how to do it. Yeah, I think you have a pretty good idea of what you're doing by now. Um, and I, I, I can take some lessons. You know, I, I don't mind learning. I'm still yeah. learning. Do you actually know how many albums you you have done vocals on? Um, no. <laughs> the <short. laughs> um, there's more guest appearances on a song or two that that that's there's many 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 of those because I yeah. get asked to do that a lot. Uh, full albums, there's less of those, uh, yeah. but there's still a lot of those too. Yeah, you've done tribute albums. You've been in in several bands. You've you've lent your vocals to other artists so i i just i don't have that answer i just wondered if you knew <laughs> no but i should figure that out i guess for somebody who asks because i don't really know i've been i mean that's on my to-do list actually yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one thing i always like to ask an artist like yourself is is do you do you own a copy of everything that you're on most things yes um there may be a few that I don't have, but usually I ask anybody that I do a guest appearance or I always ask them to send me a copy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm pretty sure I have copies of everything, but I'm sure there's a couple things I'm missing here and there. Yeah. So, I don't know. I just, I just love, I love singing and I love working and I love working with other people and I love creating. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, I don't, I don't save myself. I, I like to be out there doing it, you know? Yeah. Gravity is now I, I'm forgive me. I didn't have a lyric sheet with this, so I don't know. Is this, is it a concept album or a thematic album in some way? No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go uh, track by track, but I do want to mention some, I love the intro on melancholia. Uh, I think that that is one of those, uh, or Mel, um, I think it's one of those where Aldo and, and Vitaly work really well at the beginning of this song together. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you like the twiddly bits. I do like the twiddly bits. I'm a little bit of a prog guy. I mean, I do, I do own both Syzygy albums. So, uh, hey, 
I don't know how many people own those, but um, yeah, I, I think it, it really works well there. And, um, but there's, I, what I also like about this is even though it's sort of a neoclassical metal album, there are, there's a lot of variation here. There's a, there's a sort of beautiful kind of power ballad song in Sky Blue. And mm -hmm. um, then, you know, the, the next two songs, 21st Century Fate Unknown and, and Another Night are, um, they're not like, balls to the wall metal songs they're they're really um you know really melodic and and a lot of your vocals are doubled in those songs mm -hmm. uh, so these are some of my favorites did you have a favorite song on the album um i don't know it's different it's different uh depending on which day of the week it is i guess or when i'm listening to it but um i, I like all of them but i i really like storm of the ponds and uh, i i just like all that deep heavy classical piano playing he does mm -hmm. uh, that was really that was really kind of hard to work on because it just uh it's all that song is all over the place with piano stuff and the breaks and the breakdowns and the and the different timings i mean it was pretty pretty intense yeah speaking of that is is that uh one of the toughest song you, you mentioned it being a, a difficult song but what was there one that was particularly difficult in finding of a vocal melody line for you that was one of them yeah and um, maybe the beginning too or i think the hardest that storm of the ponds was the hardest one because it was uh i i felt it was special and i really tried to, to do something good on it and it, it was you know this the song structure is, is so it it's not normal <laughs> <laughs> it's your normal a b a b c yeah. <laughs> uh on the other end of the spectrum was there one that came together easier for you well S sky blue came together really easily and gravity those were really easy songs to do they were more more typical kind of rock songs i guess yeah. ballad and rocker so this with a project like yours it's international is, is there any chance of any live shows for this stuff well, i sure hope so I, me and Vitaly both really, and Aldo wants to do it too. So if the Frontiers looks like they're going to promote this, I mean, we need some promotion to get to get the name out there so we can do some shows, but we definitely want to. Yeah. And I hope, I hope we do. Yeah. I let's say, that. let's say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are going to. Yes. Yeah. We'll definitely, we'll probably, did I say definitely probably? <laughs> Definitely going to Japan and Europe for sure, and hopefully we can do some uh, shows. God forbid, in the United States of America. Oh man! And now, now you're just talking crazy. You're asking, uh, I know. <laughs> you're asking musicians to get uh, visas to come and work here and that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but uh, it would be really cool to get a new Ring of Fire live album or a DVD. And, and I know that um, I know that you guys would absolutely kill it. Uh, this lineup is is really good. So. Uh, it would be great if that could come together. Yeah, I, th I, it will, it will. Yeah. We'll do it. We'll probably do a video in Japan because that's they, they just have it together with the, how they do things. They are so precise and and well equipped and prepared. It's like they are the most prepared uh, of any wherever you play in the world. Mm -hmm. Japan, they they know everything that you're going to do before you do it. They know what question you're going to ask before you ask. <laughs> it's it's uh, they're really intense, and they're the they're they're they are the f type of fans that are loyal to you forever. If yeah. they become your fan, they are a fan. They are married to you forever, yeah. and that's just great. Yeah, uh, Lana Lane said something similar to me uh, when I when I talked to her. She they they really dig her stuff over there, so uh, it's good. And and of course, you know they're rewarded. They always get a, a bonus track that's not available anywhere else. Yeah, and uh, I'll tell you, we all everybody loves playing there. So, yeah, I mean, I love fans all over the world. Fans, they're just different. I mean, there's fans in Europe, and you go play in Spain, people go insane because they don't get that much over there. And, and same with South America, when you go play down there, they just go crazy. Yeah. Um, but just the uh, the fringe elements of do doing the show, the production elements are not always the greatest in those places. Yeah, so that's the. Fans are great everywhere. 
Mark, is there somewhere uh, that fans can buy this record it, that helps you more than, say, going on Amazon and buying it? Uh, no, just buy it through the normal means. I, I'm not, well, I mean, I could buy copies from Frontiers and sell them myself, but I don't know if there's much point in that uh, because uh, I don't have my own, I'd have to have my own label to, to do that and then license it to them. But they, as it is, they are the label for for this album. Mm -hmm. So. Now, do you have um, plans for follow-ups with Frontiers? Because I know they normally do like a three-record deal is kind of standard for them. Uh, let me see. It's a two. I think it's a two. It might be a two or a three, but I think it's a two. They definitely, we definitely have a, an option. They have an option for another album at least. Okay. Well, the album is called Gravity by Ring of Fire. I hope it does really well for you, Mark. I'm enjoying that. I'm enjoying your your Shining Black album. And I enjoyed hearing, uh, you know, about the making of this and about your background. Um, where can folks find you online? Where are you active on social media? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm just I'm just starting to get better at it. But I have I have I think Mark Bowles official dot com is my website. <laughs> I should have that written down. <laughs> I don't know. I have a website and I do have I have a page. Uh, Mark Bowles official Facebook page and I have a couple of personal Facebook pages too. And I'll answer anybody. Send me a, a message on there, a direct message, and I'll answer you. No problem. There you go. You, want, you got any questions about this uh, album or anything that Mark's done, send him a question on Facebook, and he'll get back to you. Absolutely. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for your time today. This has been great. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And, again, I, I, hope that, uh, I hope that Gravity does really well for you. Thanks. I hope so, too. I'm excited about it.